everybody. Uh, it's great to be here uh, for the fifth time as a Bain company and, and myself uh, to, uh, to chair and, and run this panel of distinguished speakers. Uh, so fantastic to see all of you again. Um, when, uh, when we started uh, thinking about this panel and about impact investing, about long-term sustainability, um, of course, the key message or key theme was around climate, society, people. Now, today, there's a, another dimension to this, to this discussion. It's a, it's a humanitarian crisis that we, will, that, are facing, that we are facing, and we will address it also at the end of, of, of this panel because it's, uh, it's very difficult not to, not to address and not to really think about what impact this will have on all of us as a society and as well as on businesses that we all represent. But let me start with uh, uh, sort of the primary reason why we talk about this, uh, this panel. And the question is, are we running out of everything? Are we running out of water? Are we running out of um, uh, minerals? Are we running out of uh, labor? Are we running out of technology? So, and do we have time really to, uh, to not to do anything and stay still? So the panel today will be about what do businesses do and how do you actually combine the sustainability and the responsibility to the society with making money, with making profits, which is of course one of the uh, key reasons for businesses to, uh, to exist. But before we get into details of this, uh, there is a need probably to do a little bit of a discussion about definition. Years ago, a few years ago, uh, it was about um, uh, green, fi green financing is today. Years ago, it was CSR. Uh, there's a sustainable, sustainable way to invest. Now it's ESG. So there are lots of different definitions. And I would like to ask uh, panelists, how, how do you actually view this, this, uh, uh, this area? What is important? How do you define uh, what's the sustainable way and responsible way to behave? Maybe I will ask uh, Monica to, to start with, uh, with definition. What, what are we talking about? Thank you, Jacek. Thank you, Jacek. Better? Hello? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jacek. Um, let, me, let me explain a couple of definitions that uh, we use at Abers to distinguish between CSR, ESG, impact investing, and green finance. Uh, CSR is the way that business can contribute to the social ecosystem, is more focused on uh, sponsoring and philanthropy activity. So it is how business can contribute, but it's not really how you do business. ESG is a methodology of doing business. So if you do things right, if you respect environment, if you respect your uh, human resources capital, your clients, uh, your, the, the whole value chain, you do things right. This is what we think ESG is, and this is what Abris is focusing, about, uh, focusing on. And then there's impact investing, which is investing money with the purpose, with the purpose focused on environment or society. It's slightly different to private equity, it's very different to venture capital. Purpose is considered equally important criterion to financial results. And green finance is uh, encouraging products and services to positively impact environment. This is how we look at the definitions. You know, for, for me, uh, it's accepting responsibility our business has on, on the society, on the environment, on, on any other sort of, you know, relation we have with, with, with the society. And, you know, it's a kind of a culture in the organization. And I've noted that uh, in those companies where ESG are only three letters 
ESG, they have procedures, reporting in place, and that's run in a very you know, pragmatic way. There is no real impact and no real ESG. That's more greenwashing and, and only a marketing exercise, other than really you know, having impact on the society. And um, so, so the cultural thing is the accepting that we do impact and that we need to try at least minimize the adverse effects we can have on environment, on society, and try you know, to build on it and, and support the, the, the environment we, we operate in. And in, in those companies where it's a purely reporting and process matter, the ESG will never work. You know, it's a kind of the cultural thing you need to accept and embed in your business processes and, and mentally in the organization, you know, in the, in the brains of your co-workers. Because otherwise, this would be only, you know, kind of thing you, you do, but you don't really focus on it. So that, that's my definition. If I could pick up What's on that, definition? even though a lot has been said, uh, first uh, let me mention the mindset which you start talking about. Uh, it's not only about regulations, and procedures and stuff, it's about building a consistent mindset in the company, the mindset that is about responsibility, it's about ESG values, and basically recruit and maintain people who have that right mindset uh, and there's no compromise about it. The second remark is about uh, where should the sustainability reside in the company structure? In the past, companies had CSR strategies or policies and then business strategies. Now there is no other way but to embed the sustainability strategy into the business strategy. They have to be one. In our case, we'll soon, I hope, we'll be announcing our new strategy. ESG is one of the four pillars of the business strategy for the years 2022, 2025. We have metrics, we have measures, we have KPIs related to how we operate in the business environment. And the last remark is, uh, is about something different. We've talked a bit about how we do business, but it's also important how we behave as corporate citizens. So one thing is what we do vis-a-vis -vis our clients uh, and with them, but an equally important thing is to be um, integral internally. So you know, in companies like ourselves, we buy 100% of electric energy from renewable sources. We use less and less paper. We don't, you don't see a plastic bottle uh, in the bank. We have even bees uh, on top of uh, our head office buildings uh, producing honey, which are small things at times, but they have symbolic mindset creating uh, impact. Thank you. And Patrick, what's your definition? Yes, thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. Uh, so, indeed, as a banking sector, as a financial sector, we can definitely influence the entire environment and how we look at it in, at BGK. Uh, we do assess the impact of our operations and we have in mind, of course, not only environmental but also social aspects. We have dedicated programs, financing and so on and so forth, but we do assess how we do impact our society and our economy. And um, of course, it, it was mentioned that it's also the case of regulations and uh, we will have to oblige with them. We will have to prepare and we are preparing ourselves, but we will also have to build awareness among our clients. And I think that it is uh, worth mentioning uh, that uh, according to the recent PwC study, for example, nearly 30% of investors are willing to lower their valuation or even withdraw from an investment if ESG risks are too high. So summarizing ESG risks are already and will become even more important for the financial market and we definitely will keep on assessing our impact on the society and economy. Let me pick up on, on this topic of investors, how they think. When we, uh, we just published as a Bain our annual private equity report and we, where ESG was a big part of, of, of the discussion and the report, when we asked the LPs or people who invest money in, in the funds, 70% um, of them basically said they already have 
ESG policies in place. And 80% or even more said that um, they will sort of force the uh, private equity firms to apply those policies. Half of them said if the uh, fund does not have um, ESG structure policy, they are actually willing to walk away from the investment. So the question to uh, to two uh, ladies from the private equity world, so how do you, do you do it because the uh, investors want you to do? Uh, what do you do as a fund? And what do you do with your portfolio companies to actually go down with those policies and make sure that your portfolio companies also behave in a responsible way? Okay. Um, I'm unlucky today. <laughs> thank you. And th you see, this is how we cooperate in Poland. <laughs> so thank you very much, Magda. Uh, of course, pleasing our investors is uh, one of our priorities, and uh, we like uh, to offer them whatever they expect from us. But uh, first, we are trying to, you know, to decide who we are. And uh, several years ago, Abris made a decision that we are going to transform into a responsible investor. And uh, this had several consequences on how we are operating, how our team is built, and what our strategy is. We started from creating the three people team uh, that uh, I have the, the, the honor to head. And uh, these are fantastic people focusing on implementing ESG within Abris as an organization, but then cascading it to our portfolio companies. Uh, and the third line is sharing whatever we discover, whatever we build with our ecosystem. So we are happy to share it with our colleagues, with uh, other firms. We spend a lot of time with venture colleagues, uh, pop well, promoting ESG uh, in, their, in their activities as well. We have changed our strategy, so ESG is a part of how we think about investing. ESG elements are uh, at each milestone of our decision-making process. So starting from due diligence, we have devoted a lot of energy to create our own ESG due diligence scope and methodology. Going through the portfolio monitoring uh, and then exiting. And then the final element, apart from the strategy, policies, procedures, KPIs, we have built three years ago our own tool. It's a digital tool which helps us measuring the, the, the impact, how we are doing, delivering this. And uh, at the end of each investment, we can demonstrate to our investors to make them even more happy that it works and there is a true value created from uh, uh, our work. Um, I'm not going to repeat the process as Monica discussed this because basically that, that's the same. It's embedded in all stages of our investment process and we are starting very early in the due diligence phase. You know, a couple of years ago there was due, due diligence on legal matters, financial matters, tax matters, and now we are screening our potential investors' investments also in respect to the ESG processes and, and, and how this could evolve under our management and if it's sufficient. And you know, there were already several cases when we decided to pass on investments only because of the pure ESG processes in the organizations. And if we are going to team up with the founders who are staying with us in the business and are going to run it for us or, or with us, and we do not agree on certain processes in ESG, on how we treat our employees, on how we run the governance processes, or we would like to reduce the impact on the environment, it's difficult for us to pursue the, 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 those investments. And that's basically what investors require. Of, of course, they require a lot of reporting, procedures. You know, there's a lot of additional work, but they want to see that uh, this is a part of our investing culture, that, that ESG. But I don't think that investors are anymore the main driving force for ESG. Those are clients and customers now. Because clients would require you to have your investments uh, with carbon footprint, uh, footprint neutrality, or at least the route how to 
reach that, they would require you to, to have the recyclable materials used in, in packaging. You know, so the, the shift of the power in ESG shifted from uh, investors who were interested in not, you know, bearing risk of repu reputational risk in respect to um, their investments in us to clients and customers who are pushing us, for, us further and further because they would like to see the responsible businesses. So, you know, that, that's all of us who are, who are doing that more now than investors themselves. And I think that that's an important shift that, that we are seeing recently. I will come back to those customers and how we measure that, but let me now ask the banking um, representatives. So how do you measure the impact and how do you apply those measures to your customers? You created the, the Sustainable um, Council. Um, what was that? And, and how, how do you, Przemek, look at your customers when they come and say, I want a credit from you. I mean, would you not give a credit to somebody who is not uh, ESG compliant? Let me start elsewhere a bit. Uh, we've talked about regulations and there are lots of regulatory frameworks being developed that are to enforce the corporate universe towards more sustainable behavior. But I personally believe that regulations can somewhat help but it all starts in the way we think and the way we act. To give an example, we don't steal not because we are afraid to go to jail. We don't steal because we believe this is the wrong thing to do. Okay? And there could be many examples like that. So for me, embedding responsible thinking and acting is something that should become the universal value shared by well, everybody, and definitely by everybody in this very room. B back to your question. Um, first, years ago already, we gave up uh, on a significant business opportunities, saying to ourselves and to the outer world, we'll not finance coal, we'll not finance uh, coal-fired power plants. There's no way we would touch any of such projects. Moreover, we would not touch any companies that are involved in coal mining or production of dirty energy, uh, which was a business decision uh, costing the bank quite a lot of uh, uh, revenue that otherwise we could have uh, gotten. Um, if now we are approached by a company that hasn't got a proper ESG policy or that is polluting the environment or doesn't meet uh, our social or governance standards, we will certainly not lend. We would not even enter into any business relationship. And I believe this is, again, the right thing to do. Uh, money is important, returns are important, but uh, uh, our investors are ready to accept that we miss on certain opportunities to behave properly given, given the circumstances. You started talking at the beginning, Jacek, about uh, are we running out of various things. I believe we are primarily running out of time. This is the last call, the last moment when we can do something to protect the planet, not only for ourselves, but for the young people in this room, for their children. Uh, and, you know, there is no way out. If it's going to cost businesses certain lost opportunity, this is fine. We need to take it. And, uh, Patrick, anything to add on top of what Przemek said from the banking um, uh, world? Yes, I, I, I definitely agree that it's best to be with a mindset, to change it as a mindset and the priorities um, and uh, what we want to, where we want to stream our, our finances. But I think that the regulations can somehow help. And for example, EU taxonomy uh, should stream the funds to the sustainable investments. And um, we, as a, as a bank, we started with building awareness internally. Uh, we have performed and uh, prepared several um, trainings for our, for our employees. And now what we are starting to do is also uh, to discuss those ESG aspects and sustainable finance with our customers. We are just um, introducing a new questionnaire where we will be asking several questions to our clients to, to assess different aspects of the ESG risk, uh, which doesn't mean that we haven't been looking at the social uh, issues um, previously. 
we, we've done it before, but we are currently preparing ourselves for those new regulations, which will require much more data to be collected from, from our clients. To, to some extent, my job is quite easy because we have four panelists, they all agree on everything. Um, so let me put a little bit of controversy into, into this. There are some companies that would tell us, well, we're doing this for the PR reason, because if I don't do it, and especially American investors, or American, American companies, if I don't do it and there's a negative press, I am in trouble. And it's a big cost to me to, to do all of the stuff that you guys done. So do you believe uh, that this is um, really a long-term value creation thing? Or is it a must because they say so? Or is it really a cost? When we calculated at Bain what could be an impact of different elements of ESG on the EBITDA, and there is an argument to make that uh, because of, um, uh, of a, a value creation element, you can bring additional two, three percentage points to EBITDA, and because of uh, risk avoidance, you can bring another two, three percent. But that's, uh, that's on the assumption that your customers actually will buy your product if you produce uh, ESG compliant or good product. And uh, that there's a belief that if you are not, maybe some of your suppliers will not deliver goods to you, etc., etc. So there are some business reasons. Do we believe that this is a long-term value creation element or it's sort of something you need to do because it's good for society or, it's, or maybe it's just a cost and that's it? Um, so I do believe that that's a significant value creation lever, but of course there is cost involved. At the beginning, you need to invest us in everything to, to, to start seeing the value coming uh, out of it. However, what I feel that the ESG and ESG requirements really drive innovation. Because if you need to, um, to engage more so uh, resources and, and sourcing and money in, into it, you're trying to find the ways how to navigate around innovation and, you know, and have something out of it. And I, I have a good example uh, of that. We had a company in our portfolio, it's not anymore uh, in it, it was sold. However, um, that, the company was producing castle marble basins and, and sinks. And one of the products used in the, the, the formulation of the, the product itself was, was uh, causing the co toxic emissions. And they were close to limits. So we needed to engage the R&D department to work around that and change the formulation of the product, you know, not to exceed the limits and, and have the penalties imposed. And not you know, to, to, to have the uh, adverse effect on, on, the, on the environment. And the R&D department did a great job because only by changing the formulation of that product itself, that that product was cheaper to produce, uh, easier to transport, and you know, and then EBITDA was was better because, only because of that. But because the cost, that the cost involved was just lower. So you know the ESG will drive the ESG need of using responsible resources, of managing your waste, or using the green energy, will drive the efforts, uh, the efforts to innovation and, and to promote the innovative ESG-friendly products. So I think that through that, you're really getting the value created for your organization. So that, that, that's the important, one of the important points, I think. Thank you. Yes, like you brought controversy. Magda brought uh, inspiration. Let me now bring some drama to the picture. So <laughs> how we define our success is how well we sell our portfolio companies and whether we are able to raise another fund. So today when we are selling our portfolio companies, ESG is a subject that uh, is investigated in uh, ESG due diligence, and people based on that either increase, increase or decrease the valuation. So there's a true value. If we do things right, and uh, the due diligence process is successful, 
we can really stand strong and get one extra EBITDA on top of this at least. But in the future, when we talk to potential buyers, large, cor large corporations or big financial players in the region or even globally, when, they, when we talk to them whether assets in our region will be attractive in the future, the answer is yes, only if there's ESG involved. So the drama here is that today we can get more for ESG, but tomorrow these assets will be either sellable or non-sellable. No other way. Situation. No other way. And for us, as private equity houses, if we don't really tame ESG, if we don't have it well organized and implemented within our daily practice, we just won't be able to raise another fund. And the investors that I'm meeting here for the last three days, they keep praising us, okay, you're doing really great, tell us more and more. And every, every year, the, the questions are becoming more sophisticated and their decision-making process is more strict. So, so you're saying there's a value creation element, but if you don't have it, it's actually value destruction. It's like to be or not to be. Yeah. And there is an estimate that if we really focus on the energy transition in Poland, uh, and see tangible significant investments, the GDP will gain up to 4% up to 2030. So even at the macro level, there's potential to get stronger, to get better. Though I very much liked what Monika said uh, about the future. The word that comes to my mind is exclusion. If you don't behave, if you do not run your business in a responsible way, you will be out of that business. People will not supply you with uh, raw materials. Banks will not provide you with financing. And equity investors will not buy your stock. So there is actually no choice but to start working towards being a good corporate citizen, ESG compliant company, advanced, thinking in a responsible manner, otherwise there is no future. Uh, I'd like to come back to the previous question, which I did not answer, not because uh, I didn't want to, but because there was uh, not time, uh, on the Sustainability Council, because it could be perhaps interesting. Uh, we set up, within the bank, we set up an organization that takes care of making sure that everywhere, in everything we, what we do, sustainability is a core value. It's chaired by Chief Sustainability Officer, which is a new position uh, created. Uh, he's a member of the executive committee of the bank, so the highest body in the organization. He's got his teams working for him. And then within all other areas of the bank, there are uh, uh, sustainability ambassadors, so people who together meet and discuss and make sure that all our activities are focused on becoming more and more sustainable as a company, but also on developing our offering for either borrowing or investing, uh, investing clients in that direction. And it's a very powerful organization that I myself support uh, every single day, and there is no way back and there is no way out. Thanks. <laughs> I, I, of course, I agree that there is a long-term value creation and uh, sort of a must uh, element here. Uh, there's some data actually to support that. Uh, we track the uh, news and track the uh, growth of products that are ESG linked versus those that are anti-ESG or not linked. And over the last few years, the growth of those ESG linked products is higher four times not by four, four times. So there's a data. Another one is that a little bit of, uh, uh, to, to people here, 80, more than 80% of millennials today say that if there will be no ESG compliant product, they will not buy. Now, those are declarative uh, elements, of course, and 50% of the Polish consumers asked, would you be willing to pay more for ESG products? They will say yes. Now, when it comes, did they pay, and actually how much did you? That, I think, remains to be seen. So there's a lot of uh, declarative, but I think the trend is very clear. And then the question is, how would you measure, actually, this impact? I mean, we, 
I mean, we are all in the business, uh, uh, in the companies, we, we like numbers, we like to measure things. We as consultants, whatever is not measured doesn't exist. So how do you actually measure impact of your activities? And of course, there are lots of agencies, lots of companies that will give you some medals. There's uh, Ecovadis that has a, has a measurements, uh, they give you platinum, gold, whatever. Um, but it doesn't look like there is a unified uh, system to measure those things. Like, you know, everybody knows what EBITDA is, everybody knows what the margin is, but what's the impact of, of uh, uh, ESG activities and how to measure them? Maybe we start with Patrick. Okay, so uh, first, going back to the data, you mentioned some data, I would like to... to, to add that ESG funds raised uh, 51 billion US dollars in 2020, which is up from 21 billion in 2019. And what is more, Bloomberg estimates that by the end of 2025, global assets of funds investing with ESG in mind will already be worth uh, 53 trillion US dollars. So it's, um, it's a huge, huge aspect and huge money, which is the, the third a third of the value of all funds, which is expected by the end of 2025. In terms of the valuations, I think there are different views, but many, many research indicate that ESG factors indeed bring lower volatility. And I've just seen recently a report prepared by Aberdeen and therefore lower volatility and therefore lower risk and consequently higher risk adjusted returns. Um, this supports the views that ESG uh, can have a positive effect on both corporate financial performance and on portfolios. Um, the research also found that the impact of ESG is more pronounced during periods of market turbulence and crisis. Uh, so there are specific uh, data and statistics presented in the report. Companies with higher ESG ratings proved to be more resilient during the COVID-19 crisis, for example, in 2020. Uh, I'm a person with experience of uh, almost 18 years in valuation of the companies. And uh, this is the aspect which is also uh, interesting to me uh, as a person technically involved in those valuations. And, but I don't think that there is currently a good methodology um, presented and discussed um, but uh, we will be also in discussions with universities how to approach those aspects in terms of valuations. We've done some, uh, for example, assessment in, in, in terms of our stress tests where we do incorporate uh, ESG risks and we, we try to calculate what it means in terms of our portfolio and the effects of, on our portfolio. But it's a different, different approach and a different aim. So looking at the, at the portfolio, our banking portfolio, but it's a different story when it comes to the valuation of the particular company. And as I said, I've seen some statistics proving that it has the effect on the value, um, but I'm also personally really interested in the, in the techniques, how to uh, account for it in the valuation of the company. Thank you. Funds, how do you... How do you measure those things at private equity funds? There are like two sets, I think, of targets we are agreeing with our portfolio companies. First are individual targets that we would like to see some progress during the investment horizon from entry to exit. Those are really very specific for, for, for the businesses. Some social matters, improving satisfaction survey between employees, uh, lower number of accidents, uh, usage of paper, all, all sorts of that. But then we have also the general targets. And we have two for the new fund. First, the carbon footprint reduction, you know, on, on our way to carbon neutrality. Because and also, that's a business subject. I don't think that any responsible strategic investor in five years will be willing to purchase a company without the carbon footprint neutrality, or at least the route to achieve that. So this will impact your multiples at, at exit and, and pricing. So that's one. And the other one is, and 
women could be interested in that, that's diversity. So we decided that in our fund, number seven, at the end of the investment period, 25 of board members will be women. And you know, we need to involve the whole coaching, mentoring, the, 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 the process. However, this is the, 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 another impact we would like to have. And that's the two general, let's say, targets we are uh, going to have in the fund and, and we're going to achieve that. Thank you. I'm just uh, looking at time and uh, maybe we, I promise to shift a little bit to another topic because we're talking about impact of uh, climate changes, um, uh, social demographic changes, etc. Let's just spend the last five minutes about impact of what's happening in the, uh, in the world today. We are on the 17th day of the war, so you as businesses, what have you seen as an impact? I don't want to, of course, undermine all the humanitarian element, just want to focus a little bit now on, so what, what do we see? What, what, did you see anything already? And what do you think it will happen, what you will see? And what, that's one aspect, and the other one, what did businesses do in the last 17 days? How your companies behaved? Uh, uh, to help to help in the crisis. Monica, we can start on with you. That's a kind of very um, difficult topic to talk about, but uh, there are several layers. Uh, I spent last three days here in London talking to different investors, and the first impact that I see is that people sit tight and assess, if that tells you anything. So they hold their breath, and uh, there is uh, scratching heads and thinking, do we still want to invest in the region? So it's a kind of um, sad impact that I see. I hope this will change and, and people will really regain energy to, to come back to the region and uh, help us doing business there. On the other hand, in our portfolio, what we see is that our management teams jumped immediately on strengthening their business continuity plans, which means they uh, analyzed the possibility of gas, energy, and all sorts of resources for that kind being limited or shut off. So we are building plans B. We all saw that there is uh, an impact on exchange rates, the currency behavior, and uh, most probably there will be even more impact on interest rates. So we have to deal with that. Uh, so the trans transition of cost to pricing is happening now and I'm really happy to report that the retail is working very closely with our FMCG companies. And, and so people are just trying to live normal life, reacting to, to what's happening and every day is a new day. Every day we make new plans, we make new decisions. Przemek, what, how, what do you see it from the banking perspective? Uh, let me talk more about what we've been doing over the last 17 days, uh, and then if there is still time, I'll, I'll mention my view on the impact uh, on a longer term basis. So we are in a specific situation. There is a sister bank called Ukrsi Bank operating in Ukraine. It's part of BNP Paribas Group. The bank employs uh, close to 5,000 people. So from the very, very first day, uh, people started escaping the war zone and arriving to Poland. And we said on the outset, we need to take responsibility for all the refugees who are either employees or families of employees of uh, Ukrsi Bank. So we pick them at the airport, we bring them to a hotel nearby so they can uh, sleep and get a hot meal and then we bring them to one of the seven hotels that we have rented uh, in Warsaw or in the area. As of yesterday, uh, we, were, uh, we had 670 refugees we were taking care of. On top of that, medical, uh, medical support, psychological support, documentary or forma support with formalities, later on schooling for the kids, Polish lessons, and very importantly, employment. We also, I've said that very clear and loud in the bank, that from now on, uh, employees of our sister bank who, who've made it to Poland have an absolute priority in finding employment in BNP Paribas Bank Polska. 
And of course, it's more to come. Uh, we'll need to add new elements to this overall support activities, uh, but it's been our main focus. On top of that, on the very, very first day of the war, we waived all the fees and charges uh, related to our Ukrainian customers. We've got about 200, we had back then about 270,000 of Ukrainian clients. This number has been growing very fast also because we, we've simplified the rules and requirements for account opening. Many people who arrive in Poland badly need a bank account. They brought some money or they are hoping to get some money via bank transfers, which previously was not that obvious and simple for people without Polish residency. And on top of that, let me say that we have also supported our Ukrainian employees. We've got over 250 colleagues in the bank who are Ukrainian citizens. We've, we've immediately supported them financially, psychologically. Uh, they are our brothers and sisters. And for me, it's part of being a responsible company. And when it comes to the impact, there are so many question marks that it's hard to predict. Well, we know inflation will rise on the back of higher commodity prices and uh, increased uh, domestic demand. We know that the growth will be lower than initially anticipated. We know that uh, we face the risk of stagflation, which is not something to look forward to. Higher military spending, big challenge related to the waves of, uh, of refugees that uh, over 1.5 million are already in Poland. And, uh, well, this is big. So we all will need time to assess, and a lot depends how and when this horrible war ends. Okay. Now, I, I, I uh, fully share, and all businesses in Poland did so much already. It's probably just a little compared to what is needed, but it's really um, uh, very appealing how, how, how great it is. So, unfortunately, we ran out of time. Uh, so, I would like to thank you all for participating and thank you for listening to us and uh, uh, wish you a good day and a good rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you.